Amen. Thank you, Charlie. Good morning. I'm glad you're here. My name is Luke. If we've not met, I know I say that every week, um, but I mean it. If we've not met yet, I would love to meet you after the, after the gathering. I um, just want to thank you for coming. I know how hard it is to show up to an auditorium where you don't know anybody in a high school. I say that all the time to take some of the pressure off guests. I know how hard it is to show up and be a part of something like this. Um, and I'm just going to shoot all of you very straight from the get-go. Today's passage is not the most exhilarating passage in your Bible, and it's okay to say that. All right? We believe as a church that every single comma, every period, every letter in your Bible is inspired by God. It's his idea. He thinks it's a good idea, but not all of, all of it is your, your go-to favorite. Not all of it rolls off the tongue like John 3.16. We're about to read a long passage together of ridiculous and easily forgettable names. I've worked very difficult. I mean, listen, I've spent serious time trying to deliver a B-plus performance on pronouncing them today. I'm going to do the best I can. But it does read like a list of credits in a Marvel movie. Whenever you get down to graphic artists, and there's 900 graphic artists there, you forget those names as soon as they scroll by, but they each played a very important part in the movie. Thor's hammer doesn't glisten on its own, right? Somebody had to be hunched over a computer for 93 hours to make it look just like that. Your Bible has a few passages like this, like the lineages, at the beginning of Matthew and at the beginning of Luke. There's just a lot of names. They come and they go, and you move on. Or if you go to the very back of Romans, the book of Romans, you have Paul spending this long amount of time saying, hey, tell so-and-so I said hi. Hey, whenever you see this guy, give him a high five for me. It's a long list of names in that salutation. And if we don't have eyes to see the beautiful narrative and the principles hiding behind those passages, we lose the moment entirely. It's okay to admit you're not going to memorize this list of names. That we're going to read today. It's very possible the majority of this room has never even read this part of their Bible, but it is profitable for us. I mean, the Bible declares this. I believe it, that it's profitable. It says this in 2 Timothy 3, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. God has a reason for Nehemiah 3. He thinks it's a great idea. He wants us to spend time looking at it. This list is going to profit us today. It's going to correct us. It's corrected me. It's going to train us in what it looks like to walk in a gospel-shaped, Christ-shaped life. So it's also going to answer a pretty big question for you and me, which is, why are we here? I don't mean like, why are we here on this planet? That's another sermon, right? We could always preach that sermon, but why are we here today? Why, why bother? Listen, why get up at 10.15, right? Let's admit it. Why get up at the last minute and rummage through the closet looking for something that you want to wear but you haven't worn recently? Why go through the trouble of cramming our toddlers into clothes that they don't want to wear, sitting in line at Starbucks before we get here? Why go through the bother? Well, it's, it's trouble. Why go through the bother of going to a living room, a missional community during the week? Sitting with people that you might not love. Why go through the trouble of something like that? Peter says that many people are in the habit, and this is in the early church. In the early church, when allegedly it was just so rambunctious and explosive and magnificent, that's what we think, right? He says that, yeah, well, many are in the habit of ditching gatherings. And we would think to ourselves, why? Why? Why would they ever skip a meeting? Why would they ever skip a Sunday? This is the early church. We know why. Because <laughs> they're busy and they're tired, just like we are. They've been burned. And they're burned out, just like we can get. Why put our shoulders into something like a gathering or a missional community or a DNA? Why put our shoulders into a Bible study? Anything, really. When it just barks at us that it's not going to give anything back. There's actually a group of people in this passage today that's going to ask those very same questions, but they're going to come to a different conclusion than you and I are. They are shaped not by the gospel, but they're going to be shaped by their feelings, their comfort, their image. But let's look at this passage today and let it do all the work for us, even though it's going to look on the surface like it can't do any work for us. Let's look at Nehemiah 3. This is the word of the Lord for you and me today. Then Eliashib 
the high priest rose up with his brothers, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and set its doors. They consecrated it as far as the tower of the hundred, as far as the tower of Hananel. And next to him, the men of Jericho built. And next to them, Zakur, the son of Imri, built. The sons of Hassanah built the fish gate. They laid its beams and set its doors, its bolts, and its bars. And next to them, Merimoth, the son of Uriah, the son of Hakaz, repaired. And next to them, Meshalem, the son of Berechiah, the son of Meshezabel, repaired. And next to them, Zadok, the son of Banna, repaired. Hey, how am I doing so far? Pretty good? Y'all don't know. Y'all don't know if I'm doing good or not. And next to them, the Tekoites repaired, but their nobles would not stop to ser- or stoop to serve their Lord. That's going to be important for us right there. Did you notice the abrupt pivot? Everyone's throwing their weight into this. Everyone's putting their, their shoulders behind their work, except for these guys. These guys are saying, nah, we're good. We're good. Let's keep reading. Joyada, the son of Pasea, and Meshalem, the son of Bezadiah, repaired the gate of Yeshanah. They laid its beams and set its doors, its bolts, and its bars. And next to them repaired Melatiah, the Gibeonite, and Jadon, the Moronathite, the men of Gibeon, and of Mizpah, the seat of the governor of the province beyond the river. Next to them, Uziel, the son of Herhiah, goldsmiths repaired. Next to him, Hananiah, One of the perfumers repaired, and they restored Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. Hey, noteworthy, he makes perfume for a living. A perfumer. I mean, this just underscores what we've been saying. These are ordinary people. They didn't have YouTube figuring out on how to build a gate or anything like that. These are people that do not do construction for a living. He makes perfume. Probably does a great job. Probably not so helpful for him in this moment, but he's going to learn how to do it, right? Verse 9. Next to them, Rephaiah, the son of Hur, the ruler of half the district of Jerusalem, repaired. Next to them, Jadea, the son of Heramoth, repaired opposite his house. And next to him, Hattush, the son of Hashbaniah, repaired. Malchijah, the son of Harim, and Hashab, the son of Pahath Moab, repaired. In another section of the Tower of the Ovens. Next to him, Shalom, the son of Halahesh the ruler of half the district of Jerusalem, repaired, and he and his daughters. Right there, by the way, be a great joke to talk about how a man would build a wall with his daughters, but I won't tell that joke because it wouldn't be classy, right? (laughs) But I always find that little part to be a little interesting. You see these different divisions. Some of them are by names. Some of them are by towns. Some of these divisions are by what they do for a living. You have craftsmen, goldsmiths, perfumers. Some are going to be by religious profession. Some are going to be Levites. Some are going to be priests. On and on. These different divisions for different reasons. Even this guy repairing with his daughters. You know, it's also important to maybe point out that for every name mentioned, there are dozens, maybe hundreds of names that are not. There are over 40 groups of workers named in more than 40 individual projects on this wall. It moves in a counterclockwise manner around the outer wall of the city in such good degree of detail that archaeologists heavily leaned on this for the initial surveys and work around Jerusalem. It's so accurate. But what's important is that it took the cooperation of hundreds and hundreds of unnamed people also not gifted in construction. Also doing things like selling insurance. Also doing things like making shoes. They just did things, but this isn't what they did. Let's go back into our passage. Verse 13. You're doing great, by the way. Hanun and the inhabitants of Zenoa repaired the valley gate. They rebuilt it and set its doors, its bolts, and its bars, and repaired a thousand cubits of the wall as far as the dung gate. That means exactly what you think it means. That was the gate that they used to take all the trash and boo-boos outside the city. So whoever drew that short straw drew a very short straw. Verse 14, Malchijah, the son of Rechab, ruler of the district of Beth Hakarim, repaired the dung gate. He rebuilt it and set its doors, its bolts, and its bars. And Shalom, the son of Kolhoza, 
ruler of the district of Mizpah, repaired the fountain gate. He rebuilt it and covered it and set its doors, its bolts, and its bars. And he built the wall of the pool of Shelah, of the king's garden, as far as the stairs that go down from the city of David. After him, Nehemiah, the son of Azbuk, ruler of the half district of Beth Zur, repaired to a point opposite the tombs of David, as far as the artificial pool and as far as the house of the mighty men. That's not the same Nehemiah that this book is named after, by the way. Hey, isn't it interesting that Nehemiah is the least weird name that we've read today? And that's a very weird name. <laughs> Verse 17, after him the Levites repaired. Rehum, the son of Bani. Next to him, Hashabiah, the ruler of half the district of Keilah, repaired for the district. After him, the brothers repaired. Bavi, the son of Henadad, the ruler of half the district of Keilah. Next to him, Ezer, the son of Jeshua, ruler of Mizpah, repaired another section opposite the ascent to the armory at the buttress. After him, Baruch, the son of Zebai, repaired another section from the buttresses to the door of the house of Eliashib, the high priest. After him, Merimoth, the son of Uriah, the son of Hakaz, repaired another section of the door of the house of Eliashib to the end of the house of Eliashib. After him, the priests, the men of the surrounding area, repaired. After them, Benjamin. And Hashab repaired opposite their house. After them, Azariah, the son of Messiah, the son of Anani, repaired the, beside his own house. Now, this is, you've already seen it a few times. You're going to see it a few more times. People are repairing parts of the wall that are right behind their backyard. They walk out their master bedroom, take a few steps outside, and there's the wall. And they're going to repair it. Don't you know they're tightening those screws a little bit more? Don't you know that they're making sure everything is level? They're making sure that everything is perfect because when the barbaric hordes come over the wall, which they're fearful that that could happen, they're going to make sure it doesn't happen in their backyard. You just build stronger things when it's close to you. That's a principle. After him, Benuai, the son of Henadad, repaired another section from the house of Azariah to the buttress and to the corner. Palau, the son of Uzziah, repaired opposite the buttress and the tower, projecting from the upper house of the king at the court of the guard. After him, Padeah, the son of Parash, and the temple servants living on Ophel, repaired to the, uh, a point opposite the water gate on the east in the projecting tower. After him, the Tekoites repaired another section opposite the great projecting tower as far as the wall of Ophel. Above the horse gate, the priest repaired, each one opposite his own house. After him, Zadok, the son of Imer, repaired opposite his own house. After him, Shemaiah, the son of Shechaniah, the keeper of the east gate, repaired. After him, Hananiah, the son of Shelemiah, and Hanun, the sixth son of Zaleph, repaired another section. After him, Meshalem, the son of Berechiah, repaired opposite his chamber. After him, Malchijah, one of the goldsmiths, repaired as far as the house of the temple servants and of the merchants opposite the muster gate into the upper chamber of the corner. In between the upper chamber of the corner and the sheep gate, the goldsmiths and the merchants repaired. Now, why do we go through all the trouble of reading that, right? There's a beautiful principle in there. It hits us on the nose. You probably already saw it. We're, we're different people. Functioning in different roles, in small groups, in large groups, individually. But everyone has a part to play in this beautiful moment. We are a different people working in different ways, at different spots, at different times. But we're doing it for one single purpose. We're building a wall. Now, them building a wall looks a little different than how we build a wall. And we've talked about that in weeks past as we've kind of started to walk in through the shallow end of the book of Nehemiah. Them building a wall is to build a distinctiveness between them and an outside world that looks very different. When we build a wall, we're building a church, a church full of disciples that, yes, look different than everyone around. And we see different divisions. We see everyone throwing their weight around. But different people, single purpose. That's the big thing you need to walk away with here. Had you gone into a time machine, let's say you step into a time machine, you go all the way back, you catch them in the middle of this big construction project, and you hear the, the sound of tools hitting the rocks, you smell the sawdust that's being made as they make these gates, and let's say you find a 15-year-old carrying water, and you were to stop them and say, hey, wh what is your role in all of this? 
they might say, I'm carrying water because it's hot today. And I've got about seven family members that are working on the left part of that gate. We don't really know how to make the gate, but we're really, really good at putting the stones up to make it ready to receive the gate. So that's what we do. And we're all doing this with other families all the way down the line. You read them all like I did, 42 of them, and we're all building Nehemiah's wall. It's an obvious principle for you and me, especially when we think of how we build solo, in groups, and as a whole, right? Sundays, today, might be what we would call a large group project. This accomplishes something we can't do in our living rooms or something we can do on our own. This moment has different potential, right? Different potential. This moment requires individuals and smaller groups to lead and to serve, even for all of this to function the way that it does. Some of you, as you pulled into your parking lot, you wouldn't have known this, that at 8.30, people are showing up here. That we've got one guy, an individual, Matthew Ludi, who's setting up the entire kid's the whole wing. It's like a bajillion classrooms now. And there's 13 banners so we don't put the, the, the kids in the wrong room, right? So we've got all these banners and toys that are put out and everything ready. He is an individual doing something very specific, but he's part of a team. He's part of, a, of, of our kids' community team, which has a team leader. And all of these women who are back there right now crushing it, excited to be there, excited to throw their shoulder into it. Earlier, before we even stepped out on stage, I'm back there in the green room with 14. I counted 14 people there representing our production. Those back there making all of this stuff happen on the screen or on YouTube. All of those that are going to be up on stage later leading you. We're all together praying for you, praying for this moment. Teams, small groups. But this, this is our opportunity to worship together. As we move through a liturgy. As Will comes up and leads us through announcements, a call to worship, receiving a sermon, meditation, communion, singing, prayer, giving, celebration, all of it together. It's, such, it's so much more than the sum of its parts. God truly works in moments like this. He's worked in some of your hearts in this moment. He's worked in my heart in this moment. This is what it says in Hebrews 10, 24. It's a beautiful passage. It's such a good passage, and it's a good passage for us. The author of Hebrews says this, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. Boy, it doesn't take long for some habits to set in, right? But encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. That's what's interesting about this passage. All the more... As we see the the day, the end of all ends approaching us. You see, what this is, is also, it's, it's many things, but it's an outpost of what heaven will look like. The gathered saints, loving each other, stirring each other up, celebrating next to each other, singing, praying, adoring Jesus together. We're a picture of that. One guy, Josh Vincent, says we leverage the Lord's day to anticipate the last day. There's value to this. This moment. It achieves what the missional community or the community group or the life group or the small group cannot. It serves a totally different purpose. Living rooms accomplish something that this room cannot. Agreed? For those of you who are in one, you might look at that as a smaller tribe, a family, right? A group of tradespeople maybe, just focusing on one section of the wall. Our roles change a bit, but guess what does not? The main goal. That doesn't change at all. Now, in those smaller moments, the proximity contracts, but our ability to know each other expands. Uh, Trust, it travels faster in those moments. Uh, Follow-up is steadier. It's much more consistent. We're able to share our wins and high-five each other. We can weather each other's pains. We can mourn each other's losses, and that's very important when you're building something beautiful like a family. Even mission is shaped differently. I mean, whereas we all together with our pooled resources, our pooled connections, we're able to support church planting across the county and in Thailand even, right? Your missional community can't do that. Not well. Not as much as we're able to do it, right? But you are able to look at your neighbors more specifically, more accurately. You have more knowledge of what the needs are of your 
neighbors. That and the living room is a far less intimidating space for your neighbors. You carry specific knowledge of their needs, their dreams, their hurts, their pains, their hang-ups. You're able to follow up better than all of us are. You're able to be more consistent than all of us are. You're able to be more focused. Listen, those of you in community, smaller bite-sized versions of what we're doing right now, you are building a gate together. You're a part of the wall. You're a part of the wall. I find this to be a beautiful thing in the church. That when I meet with my missional community, we're working on the, the house gate, the muster gate, the horse gate, the dung gate, right outside of our house. But it does get tighter than that, right? Even smaller than that, where we can accomplish a totally different type of wall building. And that's where we are face-to-face, a little less shoulder-to-shoulder, working on a wall as a large group of seven or eight families, but maybe just two or three or four of us working together. The role changes again, but then again, the overall goal does not. Still building a wall. Again, the proximity contracts even more. There's just a few of us. But then again, our ability to know each other deeply expands. I've got a Friday morning group that I meet with every Friday. Well, six out of eight, you know how it is. Right? We meet at 6.30 in the morning. This week, everybody was out of town, but two of us, so two of us showed up. We had great conversation. I have conversations with those guys it would be inappropriate to have up here. Wouldn't fit. Wouldn't make sense. It can get real. It can get real, real fast. It's locked up in confidence. That is also by design. We can accomplish in that moment what you can't accomplish in any other moment. Definitely not up here. This is where we learn how to be men. We learn to parent. We learn how to be good husbands to our brides. We learn how to love Jesus with deep passion. We make fun of each other. We laugh. We encourage each other. We follow up. They know my pain points. I know theirs. Listen, one meeting probably isn't earth-moving for all of us. It might not even be earth-moving for any of us. But you stack 83 of those meetings together, you will look back and you will say, I've been shaped. I've been influenced. I've been equipped. I've been stirred to love in good works. Again, the big idea, different people in different roles in different moments, one shared single purpose. This answers one of the biggest questions we've carried into the book of Nehemiah, and that is what does it mean to build or do God's work in God's way? One of the answers is to do so connected. To be connected as we do this. 1 Peter 2. This is a cool passage. 1 Peter 2. You can stay where you're at, though, if you want. If you want to keep looking at that big, long list of names, if that's helpful for you. But otherwise, we're going to be in, let me see if I can get there fast. 2 Peter. Here we are. 2, verse 4. It will be up on the screen. As you come to him, a living stone. Rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious. And whoever believes in him will never be put to shame. This is not talking about a physical building, but a spiritual people. Bricks that fit together. Beams that interlace and lock together. Friends, hear me now. The Bible knows nothing about an individualized personal relationship with God that is disconnected with other people. It doesn't understand that. To be disconnected from all the other bricks in the spiritual house, that's inconsistent with Christianity. Inconsistent. I mean, that's why we notice such an abrupt change in our passage on Nehemiah. It, it's, 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 got, it's got movement and flow to it. This guy working on that. These folks working on this. Those guys over there, they're working hard on that. Oh, the Tekoite nobles, they're not going to stoop to do nothing. This guy working on that. It's out of nowhere. You've got this punctuated moment where these guys won't stoop. Hey, interesting word there, stoop, isn't it? For those of us who know our Bibles a little bit, that's not a nothing word. It's not a throwaway word. This, what it means if you scratch away and look underneath it, 
If you, if you kind of do an archaeological dig on the word stoop, what it really means is that they would not lower their neck. Specifically, they would not lay their neck down, which means to hazard one's life. They were unwilling to hazard their life, to reveal a vulnerability, because that's what you're doing in that ancient world whenever you lower your neck. These nobles will not put their shoulders into it. But why? Same reason we struggle with it. Who wants to stoop? Who wants to hazard their life? Here's what I know about leadership and service. The stooping, lowering, risking, hazarding posture is as close to looking like Jesus as anything you will ever do. Find me something that looks more Christ-like than that. To grow as a Christian is to find this form often. It's as much about becoming a disciple as anything you can encounter in this world. Show me a guy who has read 38 books on what it means to be a Christian or a leader in the church but will not stoop. Find me that guy and I'll find you a guy who is not growing, who does not look like Jesus. I could give two rips what he knows. Philippians 2, we see something very powerful in the same way. And this is what's really convincing to me when it comes to, and it's helpful to read this whenever you think of the word stoop. Philippians 2, we're going to be in verse 2. Yep. Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest but also to the interest of others, having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And then it goes on to say, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. It's a picture of stooping. That's what we're reading right there. These nobles, they heard Nehemiah talk just like everybody else did. But they just came to a weird conclusion. They just said, you know what, this whole thing sounds a little hazardous to my health. Maybe I won't stoop. Listen, people today are still coming to the same conclusion. Here's my big question for you. And it's only because it's a big question I have to ask myself. Are you committed to the work and the people of the gospel? Are you committed to it? It's a fair question. Again, I have to ask myself this question all the time. How committed am I? How committed am I? I mean, listen, after 27 years of being a Christian, I know how to show up to things without lowering my neck. And you do too. I know how to be present in community and not hazard my life. I can refuse to put my shoulder into it and just make it look like I'm putting my shoulder into it. You want to know why? Because I can be tired. I can be busy. I could definitely be burned. I can definitely be burned out. I'm not naive. There's a self-preserving Tekoite noble in me, tempting me to withhold my soul, just like you. A little voice in your head that whispers, don't give so much. Why do you, you don't have to tell them everything you're struggling with. You don't, have to, you don't have to give so much. Give a little bit less. You don't want to burn out, do you? You don't want to be hurt, do you? Conserve. Self-preserve. Peter said, many became of the habit of abandoning gatherings in the name of what? Self-preservation. It's interesting. If you were to walk into the past, again, take a time machine back there. Again, you hear the tools hitting the rocks. You hear the wood being sawn. Had you pulled somebody aside and said, hey, what is your role here? And they looked at you and said, I don't know. I don't really know. You would know right there. And that second, that they have no idea the meaning of the moment. No grasp of the larger activity that's going on, the larger purpose. They'd have no interest of being involved. It would seem odd to you. It would seem inappropriate to you. The American church is bloated with these Tekoite nobles. It's honestly boring that so many miss the urgency and the value of the moment at hand. Years ago, before COVID, maybe many years before COVID, I went to Texas once, and I went to church with an old friend. I'd known him for 20 years. It was when I was raising money to plant this church, so that tells you how long ago it was. And I went to church with him. I'm there. I'm not here. 
And on the way there, his family's going in a different car. I'm going with him. And I said, so, hey, man, so what are you, what are you doing with these guys, this church? How are you involved? He goes, what do you mean? And in my mind, I'm thinking, what do you, what do you mean, what do I mean? I mean, are you, are you on a team? Are you in a pipeline? Are you a deacon? Are you an elder? I mean, are you part of a prayer group? Are you in a missional community? What are you, what are you doing? He goes, I mean, I'm, we're going there on Sunday. I mean, it's, we're going to be there on Sunday. I look confused. And he saw the confusion on my face. And that's because I knew him back in the day when his neck was lower, when he hazarded his life, always had a trowel in one hand, always making disciples, always risking his finances, always casting the vision for mission to the city. He knew the urgency of the moment. He knew the value of the moment. And now, not so much. Now he's making about 45% of Sundays, always the early service, of course, because the parking's easier and you don't miss kickoff. No serving, no community, no deep knowledge of anyone, no growth. No sparkle in his eye, no ache in his bones, no wall being built. And I told him, again, we're friends. I wasn't being a weirdo. I said, hey, fella, you used to be more involved. Like, I remember a different version of you. And he went on to rattle off all the things. How Little League takes about 26 weeks out of the year for him. How his timeshare deletes about three more weeks for him. How tea times take up every other week as he's there with people from work. As he works so hard, so long during the week that he really needs that Sunday morning back. It was down to where he was showing up five or six times a year or whenever I was in town apparently. And as he saw the look on my face, he, he said, look, man, I know. We need to get plugged in. I know. I said, well, how long have you known that you needed to do something different than what you've been doing? He said, we started talking about it last time you were here. It's three years earlier. And that's the way it is, isn't it? One month turns into a year, turns into three. Here's the tragedy of everything that I just said. His kids were watching all of this. They were being modeled or remodeled on how to look at church. Not this. This isn't church. You're the church. But how to look at the gathering of the saints. <laughs> Listen. No youth group can erase that. I don't care how awesome it is. They see dad, they see mom. That's what's going to model your kids. Nobles, these Tekoite nobles, they radically increased after the pandemic. Churches all over the city, all over the country, including us, had families hit eject, never to return. I would find out weeks later, months later, even years later, why that had happened. And, and I got the same... I got the same discussion that every other pastor that I knew at the time did. Hey, their time had been relocated. They had these Sunday mornings back. I did too. Listen, just so you all know this, full disclosure, I wasn't live on those Sunday mornings. I recorded that joker on Friday. I was up in the mountains on Sunday morning, right? I was enjoying the sunlight and the trees, just like you were. Don't judge me. But they, when, when we all found that extra time in our calendar, wasn't it hard to let go of it? Pickleball's fun, isn't it? Wasn't it hard to let go of that time and find yourself in this rhythm, again cramming the toddlers into their clothes, again trying to get hurry at the last minute. The game wasn't a great game the day before. Calendars grew weeds. A lot of people never made it back. A lot of people still haven't made it back. Others told me they just found better preaching online and they could stay in pajama mode. And that's true. That's true. You can stay in pajamas, you can eat cinnamon rolls, and it's awesome, right? Because you're, not, you're definitely not setting up 13 banners, that's for sure. And there's better preaching online, right? There's much better preaching online. But the real difference is it didn't make a difference in their spirituality. Listen, this is not a volunteer pitch. I'm not asking you to be a volunteer. I'm asking you to give your life. This is not some veiled guilt trip to get 11% more attendance or 13% more giving. Again, boring. I'm leading you to hazard your life to lower your neck and run fast. You have a role to play as an individual as part of a smaller community and as a part of the whole. You have a role. But we all know the pain is not just calendar pain, right? Being shoulder to shoulder and face to face as we build this beautiful wall of disciples, of people that are distinct in the land, well, that requires constant reconciliation. Putting aside our differences, which there are many, for the sake of the wall. Listen, you can't, e you can't even build an Ikea dresser 
without having to set aside your differences with your spouse who just walked through the room, didn't say anything, didn't do anything. She just walked right on through, and now you're having to reconcile. Or with the Swedes who do not write words in their instructions, just pictures, right, and little tiny Allen wrenches. You've got to put your disagreements aside all the time. I've done construction work in hurricane-ravaged places like New Orleans and Honduras, and all of us were really excited to be there. We were there for one reason, to rebuild communities. 36 hours later, as I'm sweating all over myself, I look across and I think, you know what, that guy over there, that guy, he thinks he has the best ideas. His ideas are stupid, and he won't stop with his stupid ideas. You know what, I hate his voice too. I don't even like the way it sounds when it comes out. Every time I look, he's not even, he's working like 80% as hard as the rest of us. Someone ought to have a word with him. I think I'm going to have a word with him. Take away some sleep and add a sunburn, and you can get into fist fights real fast, right? Even on a mission trip. If you've never seen a fist fight on a mission trip, that means you've not been on a mission trip. But here's the beauty. You fight, and then you make up. Why? You put your differences down and you reconcile because we enact the gospel, which is a beautiful story of a God who put down the differences he had with us and reconciled with us. He found us sinners. He found us swinging. He found us vandalizing. He found us broken. He found us sinners. Puts down his differences. There's reconciliation. So that's what you see in mission trips. Fight, reconcile, long-suffering. Another fight Forgiveness, reconciliation, long-suffering over and over and over again. That's, that's important in mission. If you're in some sort of a community expression, whether it's a missional community or a DNA or this or you're on a team, you're volunteering, you're up on the stage, you're doing something with multiple people. If that's you and somebody drives you nuts, that's what wall building feels like. It's not the group. The group isn't the problem. It's sin in mankind. It's in every group. Again, the principle here is very obvious. If I get so consumed with my comfort or my role that I forget the overall purpose, I'm going to get in the way. I'm going to be a hindrance. If I'm so consumed with being comfortable, convenienced, being right, I'm going to forget that there's a wall to build. I'm actually going to think that building the wall is all about me. But here, legacy doesn't exist to make me feel comfortable. It doesn't exist to make you feel comfortable. It exists to extend the gospel to the city. I think Ed Stetzer said it best when he says, God's church doesn't have a mission. God's mission has a church. We, you, me, are a part of God's plan to overhaul creation. The church magnifies God before other people who don't know Jesus. That's why we exist. That's our mandate. That should change all of our expectations. Now, let me be clear so you don't email me. This service, what we're doing right now, this is for God's people. Right? This is for God's people. That's why if you're here and you don't think you're a Christian, maybe you're pretty sure you're not a Christian, this is why it might feel like I'm speaking past you. Right? Because I am. I'm glad you're here. We've been praying for you. I want you to be here. I want you to be watching right now. But this is the gathering of the saints, where we come together, take communion together, listen to the, what the Word of God has to say to us. But then again, this isn't church. This is a service. You are the church. This is a rhythm of the church. Our mandate, however, is for the 84% of our city not in a faith gathering this weekend. That's our mandate. So whenever the leadership of this church hears things like, hey, man, maybe if we just did some things differently. Hey, may, maybe if the lights were a little darker. Maybe if the music was a little faster. Maybe, maybe if the women's ministry was three times a week instead of one time a week. Maybe if we had this. Maybe if we had that. Maybe if the preaching had more Hebrew or less Hebrew or you talked about politics more or whatever. Or coffee. We need coffee. More coffee. Better coffee. Anytime we hear those things, we are just going to file it under. Does it help us equip for mission, or is it just making us comfy for the sake of being comfy? Simple rubric. Listen, we're always trying to improve Legacy Church to make it two things, hospitable for the city and effective for you. Hospitable for the city, effective for you. But as soon as it turns into just rearranging our furniture to make it more comfortable for the sake of being comfortable, I'm out of here. You should be too. Because who lowers their neck for that? 
Revolutions, revivals, they're never welcomed by those who want to stay comfortable. This is never going to be a good, comfy home for nobles. It cannot. We cannot afford to let that happen. God has called us to hazard ourselves for the sake of the city, for his glory. That's center mass for us. God's glory extended to the nations, but it begins in your cul-de-sac. It begins in your family. That's our mandate. Build a wall. And as we do so in this city, we do it as individuals, small groups, large group together. You know, this odd chapter, it challenges me. It's pushed me to repent. Where am I building the wall? With who? Am I lowering my neck for it? If not, what am I trying to preserve? Where is my mandate for myself eclipsing God's mandate for me? And then, of course, back to the gospel as I repent. Because when I pray, when I repent, I'm repenting to one who has lowered his neck. He gets it. Oh, he knows. He's a sympathetic high priest. Oh, he's... He knows a little bit about stooping. He lowered his neck for me to free me from my broken mandates and my boring, comfortable, personal journey, whatever that is. He freed us for a life of building at our cost for the benefit of others who will never thank us. That's what he freed us into. He also freed us into a mismatched people who will constantly inconvenience each other constantly grow, constantly bump into each other, constantly have to forgive, constantly have to reconcile, constantly have to long suffer, constantly have to hazard, risk, toil, constantly win. That's what it looks like to win. To win. I know it doesn't sound like it. Listen, and if you don't know Jesus here, I just gave the worst sales pitch ever. I just spent 38 minutes telling you about this is all about lowering and disappearing that the other person becomes more important and Christ more magnified. But let me just say, you also gain, friend. I'm going to read a passage to you, and then we're done. This is in Ephesians 2. Now, this is to the church. Paul is speaking to the church. But if you're far from Christ, I want you to pay attention to the words, just as the rest of the room is. Paul says, so then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, But you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Isn't that interesting? That's how a lot of people walk in here or your living room. They feel exiled. They feel like a stranger. Friend, you might be that. That might be you. Never fitting in. Never feeling comfortable before the Lord. Never feeling comfortable in your own skin. Just a stranger, an alien. This is what the gospel does. Grafts us into a kingdom and a family, a family, a family of of royal blood, a family where we sit at a table, as I always say, a table we really have no business being at, in a seat that will never be taken from us, with people that have loved Jesus from time immemorial, in a new kingdom, with a new king and a new currency, and uh, with new traditions and a new banner that flies over us, and all of this is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple. It's all on Christ. The church isn't built on a denomination. It's not built on a single church. Listen, Legacy Church is going to come and go like, like grass that just grows and disappears like every church. It's not built on the shoulders of a personality. It's built on the shoulders of Christ himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Go ahead and stand with me. We're finishing now. If you're far from Christ, this is my admonition to you. Lower your neck. Lower your neck. It simply means to make yourself vulnerable. Before the Lord, the one who stooped all the way to death. For the rest of us, we have repentance as we sing and as we pray. And we're going to take communion together. So listen, we're going to do this in a moment. As a church, if you're not.